Well, as you find your seats, you can turn your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be starting in chapter 12. The title of my sermon today is Common Good and Spiritual Gifts. Common Good and Spiritual Gifts. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for the past several weeks. We were talking from the, the, the empty tomb to the upper room. Last week, we celebrated Pentecost. How many of you felt the Spirit last week in Pentecost? It was an amazing service. And I just want to remind you that the Spirit that was poured out in the upper room that we celebrated last week is still pouring out this week. And so if you didn't receive maybe the filling of the Holy Spirit last week or maybe you were praying for something and you didn't see it last week, well, that's all right. God's still moving today. And so we want to uh, encourage you to always be seeking after the Holy Spirit. But let's go ahead and get into the, the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be starting in verse 1. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are, uh, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But, in, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Let's pray, church. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you sent him. And that, Lord God, you now want to give us gifts, spiritual gifts, to empower us to build your church. And so I ask today, Lord God, that you would give us grace, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you are doing, Lord God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So, we're going to be jumping around through 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 as well as 13 and 14 today, talking about spiritual gifts and common good. Just a little context here. 1 Corinthians is written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Now, if you know anything about the church of Corinth, if you've read the book of 1 Corinthians, things got a little crazy at Corinth. There was uh, disorder, disorderliness happening in the church. Everything from uh, sexual promiscuity among church members to abuse of spiritual gifts. It was the whole gambit. Now, they loved the Lord. You know, Paul refers to them as the brethren. They were saved. They were Christians, but they had no direction. They had no order. They had no understanding. And so they were just led by their emotions, led by their own philosophies, led by their own thoughts, led by the culture, led by whatever they thought was right, but that was not how the church should be led. The church should be led by the Holy Spirit, and the church should be led by the word and the character of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is now writing to Corinthians, and this is the 12th chapter, and so he's, he's going through piece by piece, telling them how they should be led and how they should conduct their church and how they should conduct their services. And we come to chapter 12, 13, and 14, where he is specifically talking about the topic of spiritual gifts, because the pouring out of the Holy Spirit happened in Corinth. They had the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were speaking in tongues. They were using the gifts of the Spirit, but they were out of order. They were doing things incorrectly. They were doing things out of pride. They were doing things out of their own selfish desires, doing things that were hurting the church and hurting other members and turning uh, uh, unbelievers away from the church. And so Paul offers them direction and even correction in what they're doing in their church. And so we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to three, he says, again, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 
Now, Paul says here, before you followed Christ, while you were pagans, while you were unbelievers, before you understood the scriptures, before you accepted Jesus as Lord, before you, uh, you allowed Jesus to come in and start to regenerate your life, before Jesus came in and gave you his spirit, you followed mute idols. Well, what does this mean, mute idols? Well, just things that aren't God. There is only one God. There is only one living, active God who speaks to us with life, speaks to us with power, and everything compared to that is a mute idol. And even though these things couldn't speak, they still led us. Why? Because we as humans, we just, we get led astray. That's what we do. Even in our Christian belief, even the Corinthians who were Christians, they were being led astray. Even though they believed in God, they were still being led astray. The reality is that humans can be possessed and led astray by almost anything. You know, whether it's a thought or an emotion or politics or it's I don't know, it's something on social media. We can get led astray and, 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 and captivated and our mind can be, can be wrapped up in things that lead us astray even though they have no power, even though they are not God, even though compared to our living act of God, they are a mute idol. We as humans, we can still be led astray. Not because these things have any power, not because these things are gods themselves, not because these things may have any spiritual authority. No, because we as humans, we have sin. And in our sin, we cause things to have more power than they should. It's because of the power of sin within us. Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 15, verses 11 and 18. He says, it is not what enters the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. But the thing that proceeds out of the mouth comes from the heart, and those defile the man. And so what Jesus is teaching is that we have a wicked heart. Pastor Greg says it all the time, don't follow your heart, because your heart, uh, your heart is a factory of idols. Your heart is sinful. Your heart wants to follow after this and that, and this emotion, and this feeling, and this movement. And this activity and this politician, your heart just wants to follow after these different things. And it's not that these different things have any power, but the sin in our heart causes us to stumble and fall over these things. So how do you know? How do you know in your heart when you're saved, when you have the Holy Spirit? How do you know you are following the leading of the Holy Spirit? And how do you know you are being led astray? How do you know when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit that when you use the gifts of the Spirit that you're using it in service of God and not of yourself? How do you know that when you are a Christian, you are doing things not for the service of yourself or something else as opposed to following God and his Holy Spirit? Well, he gives us two tests. He says, sin will lead you to curse Jesus. Jesus is accursed. But the Holy Spirit will lead you to submit to Jesus. Jesus is Lord. He says even that if you say Jesus is Lord, you're not doing that on your own. You're doing that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a very easy test. That if you're led by the Spirit, you will submit to Jesus. That if you are led by the Spirit, you cannot curse God. Paul says in Galatians that, that if anything, even an angel comes to you and preaches a different gospel, it is not from God. If we follow God, we will submit to the authority of Jesus. That is the first and the truest test of any spiritual gift. Of anything we do in the spirit, it will lead us to submit to Jesus. This is very surface level though, right? Like, Okay, like, yeah, I shouldn't curse God. That sounds pretty, uh, pretty standard, right? You're like, okay, like, 
I have said Jesus is Lord. It seems pretty uh, standard that I should say Jesus is Lord, and the Holy Spirit would lead me to follow Jesus. Like This is a very surface-level discernment. But this is kind of the, the standard that Paul is setting, that in whatever you do, however you use the spiritual gifts, however you speak, however you act, however you go out into your business, however you portray yourself on social media or to your friends or to the world, it must show that you you are in submission to Jesus Christ. Everything you do, everything you speak, it should be Jesus is Lord. That is how we, as baptized in the Holy Spirit, those who walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, when we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, it causes us to submit to Christ and to not lean on our own understanding and live out our own sin and live out our own desires and live out our own thoughts and our own temptations. No, we have been bought. Galatians 2.20 says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And we who are people of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, how much more do we need to operate by the power of the Holy Spirit and not by our own strength, not by our own understanding, but to fully submit our lives to Jesus Christ. So this is very surface level, so Paul goes a little bit deeper. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, now in verse 4, he says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of ministries in the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So, through the Holy Spirit, there are many gifts. The Holy Spirit is going to pour out on you in a very personal way. Now, we believe that the speaking of tongues is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but that's just the beginning. That's, that's your backpack in spiritual kindergarten, is speaking in tongues, like, like we, we, we put a lot of emphasis on speaking in tongues, which is very important. That is your introduction, your introduction. But that's just the introduction. There's a body and a conclusion we got to get to, and that's healing. That's, that's, that's services. That's being called into ministry. That's allowing God to move in faithfulness. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how it's supposed to be understood. Yes, you speak in tongues, but there's more. There's more. That Pentecost was not the end of the church, but the beginning of the church. Pentecost is what started, got the ball rolling, and it's the same for us. For you who are filled with the Holy Spirit, there is so much more in store for you. And there are a variety of gifts, a variety of ministries, a variety of effects. But how do we know we're using them for God's purposes? How do we know that we're not just giving in to our own emotions? How do we know that it's not just a, you know, just like, God, is that really from you? God, God should I actually do that? God, God I, I, I think I should lay hands on them, but should I? God, I, I, I think maybe I should tell them about Jesus, but should I? The, the, we all have these doubts. We all have these questionings. And Paul wants to make things very simple for us. Very simple for us. Paul gives us all of these gifts that he wants us to be part of that he lists out in verse 8 through 10. But he says that, but to each manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. How do you know you are manifesting the Holy Spirit? How do you know you're using the gifts properly? How do you know you are in order? Well, it's simple. You are in order if you are serving the common good. If you are serving the common good, you're like, okay, Pastor Dylan, what, what is, how does that help me? <laughs> the common good. What does he mean when he says common good? Well, I'm glad you ask. Common good in the Greek is a very easy word. I appreciate these easy Greek words because sometimes they're very hard. This one's easy, and I want you to remember this. Symphero. Symphero. Symphetic, if you want to say it along with me, you can. I make the youth repeat it after me because I like to hear them mess up. It makes me feel better about myself. But you don't have to. Symphero. Symphero means profitable, expedient, advantage. It's something that's good, the common good. It's something that's good for everyone. It's something that's advantageous for everyone. But I, I want to break this down even further because it's, it really is a compound word, two Greek words of Simp and fero. 
pretty easy to understand that. Um, the word fero means to bring or to carry, to hold, to, to work. And the word sim is together, in unity, in one accord. So what, what, what do we understand with this? Well, well, simfero means that we as a congregation, we collectively are carrying a burden. We as a congregation, we have a goal. We as a church, we are not just here as a social club just hanging out. No, we are on task. We are on mission. We are called. We have a common good, a common goal, a common mission, a common vision. The Bible says my people perish for lack of vision. And what God is saying here, what Paul is saying here, is that when you use the gifts of the Spirit, it is used for that common vision, for that common good, for that common purpose, for the mission that he has sent the church here to fulfill. Paul wants us to come together, simfero. I like to think about that word simfero, that, 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 uh, that prefix, sim, is the same that we get in symphony, in sympathy, in synthesis, coming together. Think about a symphony. Uh, me and my wife, we, we just saw a symphony yesterday. I'm a, a big music lover. I love symphonies. But, but if, if and, and Paul says this in, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, imagine a symphony. Now imagine one instrument is out of tune. What happens? It throws everything off. But everything coming together with one burden, with one goal, with one vision, moving, pressing towards one thing, that is the common good. I think Paul says it better uh, in another passage in Ephesians chapter 4. Some of you may be familiar with this. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13. It says, and he, Jesus, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ." See, here, Paul is talking about the offices of the church, the gifts that God, the gifts that Jesus has given to the church, the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers, those who are in authority in the church, not for their own strength, not for building themselves up, but for the common good, for the church itself. They are gifts. They're spiritual gifts. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. No pastor can pastor without the power of the Holy Spirit. No evangelist can preach the word of God without the power of the Holy Spirit. No prophet can prophesy unless given prophecy by the word, uh, by the Spirit. These are gifts of the Spirit. And God is, is speaking through Paul, telling us what these gifts are given for. What the purpose of these gifts are. It's for the purpose of giving us all these things. He says it here in Ephesians chapter 4. The common good is equipping the saints of the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Thus, the purpose of attaining, and he lists it out, unity of faith. We just talked about that. Unity of faith. Knowledge of the Son of God. Maturity. Ooh, I like that one. Mature, as, especially as a youth pastor, I love maturity. I, I, I love to see mature youth. We're working on it, though. The fullness of Christ. These are the purposes for the spiritual gifts. When you use your spiritual gifts, when you speak in tongues and you interpret, when you prophesy, when you heal, when you have works of service, what is the purpose? The purpose is for unity of faith, knowledge of the Son of God, maturity, and to receive the fullness of Christ. The spiritual gifts must serve the common good. And so these are just some questions you can ask yourself when using spiritual gifts, when you are walking in the Spirit, when you feel the Spirit speak in the back of your head, go lay hands, go pray, go preach, whatever it is. These are just some questions you can ask yourself. Does it promote unity or division? Does it conform to our knowledge of Jesus? We don't want any heresy. Does it push Christians towards maturity? 
And does it finally point back to Christ? These are the questions we should be asking ourselves as we're filled with the Spirit, as we start moving in the Spirit, as we're walking out our lives as people of the Spirit, baptized, overflowing at other people. These are the questions we should be asking ourselves, not for ourselves, not for our own comfort, not for building up ourselves, but for these purposes, for unity, for maturity, for knowledge, and for the fullness of Christ. Now, returning to 1 Corinthians, Paul continued teachings on these spiritual gifts. And Paul writes probably his most famous chapter. And you've probably heard it at one point or another in your life. And that is 1 Corinthians 13. It's a great chapter. And it's famous for a reason. Because it is the love chapter. It talks all about, maybe you heard it at uh, weddings Maybe you heard it in maybe vows. Maybe you, maybe, you know, you, you were real cutesy. You wrote that note to a girl one day. I don't know. I'm speaking to the youth again. I don't know. But 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 are very explicitly chapters given for the instruction of the spiritual gifts. And it's almost like there's this break in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13. It's like, why, Paul, do you go into love? Of all things, why love? When talking about spiritual gifts, why do we have love thrown right in here? Well, what is love? Now, you could preach a whole sermon on that, but, but a very base understanding of love is that it is a covenant between two people. You cannot have love just by yourself. You, you can love yourself, but that's just selfishness. That's just worshiping yourself. That's just building yourself up. True love is between two people, between multiple parties, between you and God, between you and your fellow Christian, between you and your, your spouse, between you and your children. That is what real love is. Real love is unity coming together in one faith, one accord, one spirit, acting all together. And so Paul, he gives us a love chapter for this reason, because the spiritual gifts should move us in love to build up each other. Not to build ourselves up, but so that we would use our gifts in love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So, he wants to build his church with the spiritual gifts. And I want to go back to a couple of these points that, that I pointed out in, in, in chapter 4 of Ephesians that, that, that Paul gives us that we see in 1 Corinthians, for, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And that starts with the unity of faith. Unity. We just talked about how love is unity. Love is faithfulness. Love is coming together with one spirit, one mind, two flesh becoming one. Unity. Unity of faith. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, this is a very special verse, especially when you, you think about it in terms of spiritual gifts. A noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Using spiritual gifts without unity in mind. Using spiritual gifts without love for one another in mind is like being a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. It becomes a distraction. It takes away from what God is doing. It takes away from the mission of the church. Remember, the common good, pressing on towards one goal. But if someone is not pressing on towards that goal and is doing their own thing, they become a distraction. If in the middle of a symphony, a clarinet starts breaking out into their own solo, off key, in a different beat and metronome, it's going to throw off everything and become a distraction. Now, it could be a wonderful solo. It could be so skillfully and masterly put together. But with that solo next to a symphony, it just becomes noisy and clanging and a distraction. There must be unity. There must be love. There must be a common goal in the use of the spiritual gifts. We don't want to take away from what God is doing in his church. We don't want to take away what God is doing in the moment. I, it's so sweet what God has done at these altars, so sweet what God has done in our hearts, even uh, just reflecting during worship this morning, what God was doing in those moments. The Holy Spirit was moving, and the gifts were in operation. 
And I thank God that we have a church that has order. We have a church that is pressing on towards the goal that God has called his church to do. And because of that, we all enjoy the gifts of the Spirit. We enjoy the presence of the Spirit. We enjoy the love of God poured out on us. And we enjoy the love poured out across from brother to brother, sister to sister, poured out. I thank God for, for the brothers and sisters on the worship team, for, for Abdil, who, who loves this church and uses their gifts so that we can all enter into the Spirit. Not to build themselves up, even though they're all extremely talented individuals. No, they're moving in one accord, using their gifts so that we all can benefit. So that we all can approach the throne room. So that we all can obtain grace and mercy in our time of need. That's unity. That's love. And moving on, we also see this principle of maturity in 1 Corinthians 13. In verse 11, it says, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. I, I, I've heard it said that we're called to be childlike, not childish. We're supposed to have a childlike faith. A faith that just follows after our God. A faith that doesn't doubt. A faith that just takes the word of God and allows it to move in our lives, but we're not called to be childish, immature, whining, complaining. I, I work with teenagers, so I know what that's like. You know, some of you that have kids, you know what that's like. You know, we love our children because they love us with a, with a childlike love, but when they're being childish, Maybe it's a little bit harder to love them. Maybe it's a little bit harder to have order. Maybe it's a little harder to press on towards a common good. And this is why Paul calls for maturity, to do away with childish things. Even in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he tells us that we should do away with our childish thinking and that we, we should press on to maturity in our spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts should cause us to grow, cause us to change cause us to maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable, maybe some growing pains. This is the use of spiritual gifts. And this is how we see the gifts used in the Old Testament prophets. If you read the Old Testament prophets speaking in prophecies, speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, they're not just saying, you know, empty platitudes or just speaking nonsense. No, they are, they're saying some hard things hard truths, wanting the, the people of Israel and the people of Judah to grow in their faith. We see that in Isaiah. He, he teaches us that success does not necessarily mean that we're righteous, that although Israel is high and mighty among nations, they are unrighteous, and they are having wrath coming on them. That's an uncomfortable message given through the power of the Holy Spirit. We see in Jeremiah that we must have submission. Even in the event of immense suffering, it will still be worth it. That's hard. That takes some maturity. Imagine trying to explain that to a child. We need to mature so that we can take the word of God as it is. Ezekiel, he tells us that, that God is not confined to just a geographical location, but that he is coming out of his temple, that, that the rivers of living water are pouring out from the Holy of Holies, pouring out on his people, and, and the presence of God is available. Now, imagine trying to explain those realities to a child. We need to mature in our faith, and that is one of the purposes of the gifts of the Spirit is so that we can move towards maturity, grow in our faith, have a deeper understanding, not just an emotional attachment to God, but also an intellectual attachment to God so that when he brings profound truth, when he brings deeper understanding, when he gives us a double measure of his word, we're not like babies who don't understand. No, we are not just on the milk. We are eating the meat of the word, and we know that he has something greater, something deeper, something wonderful for us. But we must grow. We must grow. We must mature. And this is the purpose of the gift. We need to learn something new. We need to grow in new respects, gain more insight and knowledge. We don't just need comfort for comfort's sake. We don't just need conviction for conviction's sake. No, we need growth. 
Maybe that requires a correction. Maybe that requires comfort. Maybe that requires prophecy. Maybe that requires healing. Maybe that requires God to let the thorn sit in your flesh for a little bit. These are the realities that we need to let sink in through the power of the gifts of the Spirit. And finally, we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, I'm not going to get through this whole chapter, but I, uh, I just want to highlight a couple verses here. And you have homework. Pastor Greg can give homework, so I can give homework, okay? <laughs> Your homework, if you want more spiritual gifts, if you want to move in the gifts of the Spirit, maybe you hear individuals speaking in tongues, interpreting those, those, those tongues, Maybe you've heard of healing. Maybe you've seen prophecies, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, and you want that, and you want to move in that. Read 1 Corinthians 14. And as you read it, pray, God, I want this. God, give me direction. God, give me order. God, what is your vision? God, what is your church doing, and how can I be a part of it? So that's your homework. Read 1 Corinthians 14. But 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 to 4 says, Pursue love. Yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands. But in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church." Paul tells us that there is a spiritual gift above all of the spiritual gifts. That there is a spiritual gift that if you are seeking after, you should seek after this one. And that is prophecy. Prophecy is the greatest of the gifts. Prophecy is the highest of the gifts. More than speaking in tongues. More than healing. More than acts of service. More than charity. Prophecy is the greatest of all gifts. Yes, even for us tongue-speaking Pentecostals, we should desire the gift of prophecy. Prophecy is greater. Prophecy is not necessarily telling the future or, or fortune-telling or, or having apocalyptic visions and, and seeing the cherubim and the seraphim and, and, and the, the, the heavenly realities. That, that is prophecy, but that's, that's not all that prophecy is. And even that's, that's in the minority of prophecy. No, prophecy Prophecy is being a mouthpiece for God, allowing God to work and then speak through you. See, us who have been baptized by the Spirit, he's already working on us. We, we just read that speaking in tongues, it edifies us. It edifies us and it, it, it strengthens our connection with God, strengthens our connection to the Spirit. But that's not just so that we can have a strong communion. That's not just so we can feel good and have some warm fuzzies when we speak in tongues. No, that is so you can be led into more gifts and eventually prophecy. So that you can be a mouthpiece for God. So that you can be the hands and feet of God. This is what we should desire. Greater than tongues, greater than healing, greater than provision, prophecy is what we should desire. And I thank God. I thank God that we have a pastor who prophesies. That Pastor Greg, every Sunday, gets in this pulpit and is a mouthpiece for God. I thank God that we have an executive pastor that in our staff meetings, in our pastoral meet meetings, is always listening to the Spirit and hears all of your needs. If you have a need, if you've ever gone to Pastor Linda with anything, if you've ever gone to Pastor Kathy with anything, they remember and we pray for it. They are a mouthpiece for God on behalf of you. I thank God that we have pastors that prophesy, pastors that speak the truth, pastors that, that want us to grow and press on towards a common good. That is a healthy church. That is a church filled with the Holy Spirit and using the gifts for the right purposes. You should desire to prophesy as well. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for, for those who, who hold, you know, uh, an office in the church. No, you too can prophesy. But it takes maturity. It takes unity with the Spirit. It takes being baptized and allowing God to work and speak through you, saying, not my will, but your will be done. 
John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest of all the prophets, he prayed, may I decrease and Jesus increase. That is how prophecy happens, by the filling of the Spirit and allowing him to have total control. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. We should desire to prophesy. Paul ends this discourse on spiritual gifts in the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 39 and 40. He says, Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. We should desire more than tongues, more than prophecy. We should desire order. Our God is not an author of confusion. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of peace, love, and a sound mind. That word sound literally means oneness, coming together. This is not, the spiritual gifts are not given so that we can just be more powerful and think we're greater or, or be more comfortable or, or meet our needs. No, it's given for the church. It's given so that you can be a part of the bride of Christ in a more intimate way. So that you can know Christ on a deeper level. And that doesn't happen in a vacuum. That doesn't happen in isolation. That happens in a church. And if you want more of God, if you want a more intimate relationship with Jesus, you're in the right church. Because this is the church that's pressing on. Not just for, not, not just for tongue's sake, not just for the gift's sake, not just for the frenzy, but for Christ. To preach the gospel around the world and in our communities. To raise up men and women to be leaders. To train disciples. To proclaim Christ. That is who we are. And that is why we preach the filling of the Holy Spirit so that we, as one body, can shake the gates of hell, free the captives. That's why we're here, church. That's why we desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why we want to speak in tongues, so that we can get that backpack in spiritual kindergarten and graduate and mature and get stronger and have more authority and be able to tear down strongholds, to loose chains, to bring the captives out of captivity, to bring healing to the lost, to bring restoration to the broken. And that is the purpose of this church. Let's all stand to our feet, church. Our God is a God of order, and he requires order from his people. Not just so that he can put us under his thumb or keep us in line. No, but so that he can build his church. And so as you, you leave today and, and you read 1 Corinthians 14, ask God, how can I build your church? Maybe that means going to the membership class today. Maybe that means saying, God, I don't know about this whole membership thing. I don't know about this whole speaking in tongue things, but I know what I do want. I want to build your church. And so ask God, what can I do for your bride? God, how can I be a part of this common good, this vision, this purpose pressing forward to save the lost and to build his church? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the filling of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, God, that you have built your church. I thank God that you, Lord God, are the one who fills us and empowers us, strengthens us, heals us. I pray, Lord God, that we would be filled with your Spirit. Filled to overflowing, oh God. Filled that we may pour out on those around us in order that they would come into the fold. Lord God, I ask for unity among your people. I ask, Lord God, that we would move in your gifts. Your word says signs and wonders will follow those who believe. And Lord God, today we say we believe, oh God. 
We believe that you rose from the dead. We believe that you have called us from death into life. We believe that you are calling us to be filled with your spirit. And so we ask signs and wonders come. Heal the sick, oh God. Cast out the demons, oh God. Lord God, we want to speak in tongues so that we can connect to the spirit. So that one day we may prophesy and be used by God and be used by your spirit. Lord God, have your will done in your church. In Jesus' name we pray. We're going to open the altars. Our altar workers are going to be here. Maybe you didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. It's still available. And they'll be here to pray with you and speak with you and lead you. God bless you, church. You're dismissed. But if you want the spirit, if you want to just continue and linger, the altars are open. God bless you, church. Thank you for tuning into our service today. We're so thankful that you were able to join us. We pray that you're able to join us in person here on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock and 1045 every Sunday. We also have amazing children's programs here in the building on Sunday mornings for both services as well Wednesday nights, seven o'clock here in the building. We've got amazing children's programs. And then Friday nights from seven to nine o'clock, we have our youth programs. If you wanna keep up to date with everything going on, please check out our social medias, as well as follow everything on our website at missionchurch.com. God bless you and we'll see you around.